Hello everyone, and welcome to the Introduction in Course Logistics presentation for IS735. This should be the first set of slides you watch as it sets up what the course is about and how the course will be graded. So first, as I mentioned, welcome to IS735. This is a seminar style course on social media, section 851. There's only one section, so that should be pretty easy. It is online and asynchronous. We will not have synchronous meetings uh, everything will be self-directed and self-driven for you via Canvas. So if that's not what you're expecting, or this isn't the course you anticipated, uh, perhaps reconsider why you're listening to these slides. All right, let's jump right in. Before we talk about the class, let's set up some introductions. So first, who am I? So my name is Cody Bunton. I'm an assistant professor of informatics here at NJIT. Prior to being here, I was a postdoc at NYU's Social Media and Political Participation Lab, which is now the Center for Social Media and Politics. Prior to that, I was an intelligence community postdoctoral fellow at the University of Maryland, part paired with the National Counterterrorism Center. So I did work on how countries and communities experience conflict in the aftermath of disaster. And I got my PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland and the Human-Computer Interaction Lab. Prior to that, I was the director of research for a small cybersecurity company called Pikeworks that did defense contracting, uh, which was then acquired by Raytheon. In terms of research, uh, I direct the Information Ecosystems Lab, which generally focuses in three areas, on social media and crisis communication, social movements, and political participation, where I use text mining, cloud computing and large-scale analytics, machine learning, and social network analysis applied to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, online news, and a number of other online spaces to help make the online information, information ecosystem more resilient, higher quality, and more informative. Outside of my professional work, I really enjoy science fiction, particularly movies like Hackers, The Matrix, and The Fifth Element. I have a motorcycle. It's probably older than many of you. It's a 1995 BMW R1100RS. Over the summer, I rode it about 1,100 miles from Washington, D.C. down to Florida. And my wife and I are big fans of board games. Specifically, Mysterium is one of my favorite board games. All right. So some logistics about the course that you may find funny. Uh, high school teachers call me Miss, Mr., don't be late, watch your language, etc. Uh, college professors, you guys can call me Josh or whatever. Class is canceled today because it's half off wings. Yeah, so this is a PhD class, and as a result, between that and the asynchronous nature of the course, I'm giving you a lot of uh, sort of agency and responsibility here. My primary role is to provide information for you and do marking, that is grading your assignments. Uh, and to be here as a resource for you while you work on your assignments and project. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Uh, to make the class more engaging, hopefully, uh, remember, so I was born in the 80s, and you'll see a lot of references to movies, and probably not so much The Simpsons, but maybe Family Guy, lots of Bob's Burgers, which you'll see pretty quickly. Um, might be helpful for you to, to pick up on these, uh, so you don't feel like these slides are completely boring. So I'm trying my best not to have them boring. Um, but yeah, so good luck with that. Uh, you'll see lots of memes in class, partially because memes are a uh, major component of social media and how people engage online. And partially because, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to make the slides fun. So if you don't like that, yeah, apologies, but you know, here we are. All right, so here's the time where I would give a uh, in-class opportunity for everyone to introduce themselves, but we're online, as is most of the world for COVID-19, so I'll leave it to the discussion topic on Canvas for you to introduce yourself, uh, what you prefer to be called, include your pronouns, I think I should update that, uh, and where you got your previous degree, areas of research, and what you want to get out of this class, and then anything else you want to include. Uh, some notes on etiquette. So controversy is part of debate, right? In this particular class, uh, we will be talking about a lot of potentially thorny political and social subjects. 
around disinformation, online harassment, uh, ideologically driven differences in how people share information. This could lead to controversy, right? How do we deal with this? Well, the main thing is, you know, in class, since we're not having an in-class segment, uh, I would guide the conversation uh, away from troublesome uh, engagements, not troublesome topics. It's important to engage with those, but if the conversation starts to go a little bit off the rails or starts to become less respectful, I'd put a stop to that. In Canvas or online, our options for this are primarily uh, by my monitoring the discussion forums. Please be respectful and supportive during any discussion. Discussions hopefully will be an important part of this class, um, but if things start to go sideways, I will step in. Uh, other general kinds of etiquette when referring to your professors, unless otherwise stated, the safe assumption is to use their title and last name, like for me, Professor Bunton, unless you are told otherwise, and this holds regardless of gender. Uh, and this holds for, for class as well. You could have Mr. and Mrs. Uh, student last name, unless the student has actively told you what you, uh, or how you should uh, refer to them. Hopefully I've, I've addressed this in the introductions. Uh, for me though, by all means, call me Cody or Professor Bunton. I'm relatively indifferent as long as you are respectful about it. All right, course material wise, we do not have a textbook for this course. There are textbooks about social media analysis or social media. Uh, my old advisor, my PhD advisor, Jan Goldbeck, who you'll see probably throughout class in some of her YouTube videos. She has one. Uh, ben Schneiderman and Mark Smith have one on social media analysis with Node Excel. Uh, I may refer to those at points throughout the course, but I'm not requiring them. Instead, we'll focus much more on readings. I'll post readings on the on Canvas prior to uh, the lecture, so you can be reading through papers that are germane to that particular week's discussion. In terms of prereqs for this class, we have IS665, Math661, or some graduate level statistics course, or quantitative research methods course. The main objective here is you need to be able to understand or compute summary statistics and evaluate distributions for particular sets of data. Uh, for instance, de degree distributions from uh, social network analysis or distributions of engagement or retweets, these kinds of things. Also, there is a, a pretty strong requirement to have proficiency in Python or some relatively similar language. So it certainly could be R, Java, Ruby, Scala, uh, Perl, potentially. I have proficiency in Java, Sc Scala, Perl, JavaScript, uh, a number of other languages. Not so much R or Ruby, but you know, if you're, I'm proficient enough to re review any of your work. Uh, but you need to have some kind of proficiency in some programming language. Ideally, something that is already working with Jupyter Notebooks, so you can use the notebook aspect or, or be familiar with the notebook aspect uh, that I'll be using in class. Related to this, you need to have some proficiency in using the command line or terminal or console or whatever you want to call it uh, in Windows, this is the CMD command prompt in, or PowerShell, uh, something like that. In Linux and OSX, this is the terminal. Um, it'll be very useful for you to be able to run commands that I may mention in class uh, or in the lecture. All right, so all this material will be available on Canvas. Uh, the Canvas page will link to YouTube videos for lecture. Uh, all the rest of the assignments and everything will be in Canvas, and that's where all your submissions will happen. Uh, so that's some of the logistics of the course, but now let's talk about what is this class about. So from the course catalog, the description is actually pretty long. It's a seminal st seminar style course that covers design and impact of computer-based systems for human communication. What is human communication in this case that we're interested in? We're including email, instant message, discussion boards, uh, CSCW and group, group decision support systems, social networking systems. Social networking systems in particular uh, are of interest. Uh, topics include design structures, impacts of primarily text-based communication, recent empirical studies of virtual teams, and online communities and systems for social networking and social media. 
So we'll include 3D worlds. I probably won't do much on Second Life, but you are welcome to do so in uh, your assignments or project. Uh, but I will look a lot at microblogging platforms like Twitter. Uh, there's potential to talk about Gab here and other sort of social media platforms like Reddit, YouTube, Instagram, etc. So the course is broken down into eight modules. Module one is what we're doing now. There's another set of slides for this though about what is social media and why should you care. And then we'll talk about in module two how we'll actually collect and analyze social media data, primarily collection, uh, how we actually get the data that we want to analyze. In module three, we'll take from the social media data that you've collected and we'll extract the networking structure or building graphs from social media. It's particularly important because these the whole idea behind social media, which you'll see in the next set of slides, is user-generated content on an internet channel uh, that has some sort of interaction aspect. And while you may not always be able to define networks the same way, uh, they may not always have users and friendship links, uh, they often have graph structures that are meaningful and graph structures that we can extract. Which brings us to module four about extracting insights from the graphs that we create. Uh, module three is much more about interpreting and extracting, extracting graph networks and doing some preliminary analysis to characterize the graph. Module four is about, all right, now let's learn something about the individuals or nodes or entities that are captured in that graph. Module five uh, moves away from graphs and more towards content mining. So that could be the text or the imagery or the links, uh, the web links that are shared in this space. Module six moves from a static view of the world about oh, this is what the graph looks like or this is what all the content on the platform is to a more temporal, dynamic view of the world. Well, how do we compare yesterday's graph today to today's graph or changes in the number of retweets per day or number of uh, instances of a hashtag over a several hour period to do things like event detection or anomaly detection, these kinds of things. Module seven gets more into some uh, darker sides of social media, the antisocial aspects, so some more interesting and important questions about disinformation, uh, online harassment, these kinds of things. And module eight looks at the economics of social media. So we'll talk about affordances of the platforms and what sort of behaviors these social media platforms incentivize. Now throughout all of these modules, we'll talk about ethics and some theory related to the particular topic throughout the course, which you'll see in a few minutes. So the course also has six core learning objectives. The first is being able to collect digital trace data from social media platforms. This is primarily about platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, etc. What the underlying social media platform is, is less relevant. As long as you're, you're able to get some familiarity with using an API or some sort of programmatic means to collect this digital trace data. Now in other parts of the class, you don't have to use programmatic means. You could use survey work to do something. That's a possibility. But the main uh, learning objective here is dig collection of digital trace data in sort of an automated way. Learning objective number two, is extracting graph structures. So we collect this data, now we want to extract some structure from the network that underlies this social media content. So we'll talk about nodes and edges and what these mean. So nodes could be entities, or are primarily entities, could be users in the network, domains, subreddits, these kinds of things. And edges are some kind of interaction between them. Uh, users may have a friendship link or a retweet link or some sort of engagement like that. Uh, domains may have a citation network or uh, shared authorship, something along those lines. What the explicit structure is, is sort of up open to our interpretation as long as you are able to extract some kind of graph structure from uh, the data that you have, that's the second objective. Third is to implement sort of standard touchstone algorithms for graph analysis, community detection, network visualization, and other sort of mining tasks. So given some sort of, or given some large set of social media data, let's try and visualize the content that's, that's there, explicitly the, the network structure. 
So identify some sort of community structure, like in this in this graph that I've shown you. I'm not a huge fan of these sort of node edge graphs. So they're oftentimes like this. They're pretty, but they're not hugely informative. Uh, the color here represents different communities. The pink is one community and the green is sort of another community. You don't really capture much from this fi figure other than there's a lot more pink than there is green. And the UNFCCC is sort of a main actor in this network. But we can definitely do better than this. Uh, for instance, this is a graph of uh, code citations or references or links in the online information ecosystem. What we see is like Washington Post, New York Times, occupy this sort of mainstream space, whereas InfoWars captures a lot of content and Newsbusters and No Disinfo are also big players here, which tells us something about how this, this network is structured. This is a graph, an excerpt from Rebecca Lewis's Alternative Influence Network piece from Data and Society, where she mapped out connections between uh, fringe and alternative information presenter personalities and how they're connected on YouTube, which led to some other interesting insights about uh, how this ecosystem works. And then here is a uh, restructured version or a sort of filtered version of the first graph in the middle uh, that makes the communities much more clear and is potentially more legible. Uh, we'll talk about how all of this works, but you'll be able to create these kinds of structures. Uh, Objective four, mine and extract insights from digital trace data. So the network stuff, stuff that I just mentioned is one set. Another set is sort of understanding what's going on in the world uh, for things like looking at Facebook's ad library to understand uh, ad spending in a major platform. It's a lot of interesting work to be done about advertising, especially in the political space. And other things like predicting US elections, there's been some work on uh, election prediction using social media, not just in the US, but in other places. Um, digital storytelling is a particularly interesting area if you are interested in journalism or these kinds of things where you have some data about a, uh, an event and you wanna understand what happened. And there are a lot of other kinds of pieces of work on digital well-being and social interactions like some great work by Stevie Chancellor and, and her colleagues on content moderation on Instagram and its, its effects on pro-eating disorder communities. And those will come up with many other kinds of examples over the course of the semester as well. The second to last learning objective is being able to describe social and ethical considerations in the use of this data. So when Facebook does its big uh, emotional contagion study uh, back in 2014. There were potentially some obvious ethical concerns with this, uh, but over the course of the semester, you'll be able to get, or at least have engaged with what are those issues or concerns. Uh, for research involving public data in particular, uh, using social media data, and other examples about the applications of artificial intelligence in this space and how that will almost certainly lead to bias in some kind of way. And the last learning objective here is being able to design and execute some analysis project on data that's not already structured for analysis and be able to compare and evaluate different design choices. And really this is all encapsulated in the social media semester project, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. All right, so I mentioned the course is broken down into eight modules. The weekly breakdown, week one, we'll do introductions, that's now. Uh, week two is primarily about collecting social media data. Week three is about this graph, uh, this graph aspect, extracting graphs from the data. Week, f as will week four. Uh, week five and six, we'll talk about graph mining. Week seven and eight, we'll talk about content mining. Nine and 10 will be temporal dynamics, module six. Uh, week 11 is primarily gonna be antisocial social media and week 12 will be economics and social media. I'll probably stretch module seven into weeks 11 and 12, because uh, week 13 is, is also some flex time. Uh, I don't have anything specific there, but probably what'll happen is module seven will creep into uh, week 12, and then we'll move week, we'll move module eight to week 13. And then week 14, December 7th, is the final project presentations. 
So for each module, there'll be a set of readings. You should review those prior to watching the lecture videos because I'll assume that you'll have read them when I'm doing the lecture, so that'll help you uh, and not be lost. Uh, in terms of grading and policies, right, so there are four parts to your grade here. Uh, there are module assignments, it's essentially homework, uh, they'll happen bi-weekly. Uh, ethics presentations, so you'll have one ethics presentation throughout the semester, every student will have one, uh, it counts for 25% of your grade. A final project is 35%, and participation is 10%. I'll talk about each one of these in a minute, or individually. Uh, the late policy is, I think, relatively straightforward for a PhD course. Uh, you'll lose 20% per day, not per class, since we're an asynchronous online course, this doesn't make any sense to say per class, uh, beyond the posted due date. So if it's due, say you had an assignment due on Tuesday uh, at 12.01 Wednesday morning, now that assignment is 20% late. So if you're gonna be late, you're probably better off waiting until 11.59 of Wednesday evening uh, to submit, you know, get some sleep uh, Tuesday night and work on it Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday morning and submit it then. Uh, anything that's after five days late will not be accepted. You'll be able to post it, but I won't grade it. It won't be graded for anything. Of course, this is all uh, assuming that there's no extenuating circumstance. Uh, the world being what it is, those could certainly happen. If you have any concerns, by all means, reach out. There's also the academic policy, the university policy on academic integrity. Uh, please, primarily, this means cite your sources, especially since there's going to be writing in this course, uh, not insubstantial amount of writing. Uh, don't make me have to go look through uh, other unsighted material and like start putting stuff in turn it in. I don't want to do that. Let's not do that. Just cite your con cite your sources. That's really all there is to it. Uh, if you copy and paste from Stack Overflow, I don't have a problem with that as long as somewhere in your in your comments around the code you make it explicit and clear that that's where that comes from. Uh, or any figure you have in your in your write-ups, uh, if you didn't generate it, it's okay to take from a paper as long as you cite it very clearly that this figure comes from paper whatever and attribute the author. All right, so I mentioned there are four parts to your grade, told you the breakdowns for them. First one, module assignments or homework. There are seven of these or six-ish. Uh, all of these are writing assignments except for assignment zero, which is basically just uh, a submission. The assignments for this class are built around writing medium posts. Uh, I'll talk about why that is in just a second, but the main idea is Every assignment that you write will be in the form of a medium post that will be publicly available on the general, general internet and attached to this course as part of a course-wide publication. So you and all of your classmates uh, will have your content in the class publication and you can cite it or refer your friends to it or put it on your, on your uh, CV as part of your writing or in your portfolio, but it will be online and publicly available. Unless you have a particular issue with this, if you have an issue with this, please get in touch with me by Friday. If you don't get in touch with me by Friday, then I will assume that everything's fine, that we're good with this, and that will be the expectation. All right, so as I mentioned, all of these assignments are essentially blog posts or articles. Uh, they are thousand word posts and each one is on something slightly different or building upon the material from uh, the associated module. Every module has a blog post except for uh, module seven and eight, which are sort of combined together at the end. Now, the reason for doing these blog posts instead of writing up little reports from me is experience suggests that these sort of public facing nature of these medium posts really leads to higher quality work and it gets you something that's, I think, maybe more useful than just writing reports for me. Uh, medium posts can be fun to, to write. They can be uh, really heav heavy on graphics uh, or figures from your data. And you can sort of tell a story with them, I think, in a, in a fun kind of way uh, that maybe wouldn't necessarily be the case if you were just writing a report for me. So you can see some examples of other people who have done this. There's the Information Ex Expositions course from uh, University of Colorado Boulder. 
and Brian Keegan's class. He did this. I actually took the idea from him. Uh, feel free to check out his approach to this or some of the examples from his class uh, to give you the kinds of things that are that that you can expect to to write or some good examples of what you might uh, want to try and shoot for. I'll have another set of slides posted on using Medium uh, on Canvas. All right, so that's the assignments. The next thing is the ethics presentation. So as I mentioned, one of the core learning objectives here is to engage with ethical and social issues. Uh, you may ask, do you need to understand ethics as part of your technology education or as part of this kind of research? Especially in social media, I think this is absolutely critical. So anything that requires or is using social media data or machine learning data to, ex to engage in, in sort of computational social science aspects has some really important things that we can't just say, oh, I didn't think about. Uh, so for instance, Casey Fiesler, as a professor also at the University of, of Colorado Boulder, has done some excellent work on ethics around uh, this kind of data. This is one of her tweets about how if you take a, uh, a name and predict gender from the name, here in this example, this name is associated with uh, female gender. Uh, but if you add doctor to the beginning of it, then it becomes more male. What does this mean in terms of the bias of all this sort of natural language processing applications that get used on social media, especially when you're trying to do demographic inference? There are bigger questions about when is even inferring gender a reasonable thing to do. Um, but these are things that we'll have to deal with, especially when we get to the content mining section or the graph mining sections. Sarita Schoenbeck is, is another professor who's done some really great work in this area. And what I'm trying to do is model this class on some, some of the things that have come up in discussions with her, where when you talk about building some uh, computer science related piece of technology, you should really consider how it will get used or whether it should be built or not. Uh, it's a very important aspect today, especially. It doesn't mean that all technology is bad, certainly not, uh, but it does mean that if you build a dating website, uh, you should try and think about what sort of biases are in that data and make sure that those bias, biases are well known. For example, there's a really great paper about biases in dating platforms and how even if you, as a user, specify that you're okay with people of the same sex or other sex or people who are different ethnicities from you, these models are often very biased to put people who are similar together, uh, which means that this they become in some sense implicitly racist or uh, gender driven or ageist, these kinds of, of things, not necessarily because somebody programmed them, programmed them that way, but that's what that it encodes a bias that exists in the data. And again, it's not entirely clear if there's an appropriate way to deal with that, but you should absolutely know or at least have explored what those biases look like so you can make informed decisions about their application. This is particularly important now when we talk about COVID-19 and how people use social media around COVID-19 uh, because a recent report about misinformation on Facebook and social media at large. It's labeled Facebook a danger to public health. These are the kinds of questions that we have to wrestle with. So clearly here, ethics is more than just talking about uh, plagiarism. It's more than just talking about piracy. It's more than, than this. It, the ethics of, of social media data is a critical set of questions that we have to, to wrestle with. Uh, for instance, Facebook, as you'll see in another set of slides, uh, has a huge user population, uh, billions of users. So what does it mean for a platform that has such a reach and so much power to behave ethically? And how does that compare to what it means for you to behave ethically? If you make a decision, how many people will it affect versus if Facebook makes a decision, how many people does it affect? Uh, for instance, in 2014, uh, Facebook ran a study on emotional contagion uh, with professors at other universities. It went through IRB, it went through review by an ethics board. They said it was fine. And the sort of, uh, Cliff Notes version of this was Facebook would inject or sort of uh, 
show people more emotionally laden content and then evaluate whether different emotionally laden content drove different users to post uh, differently. So if you saw negative content in your feed, you're more likely to post negative content. If Facebook drove more positive content to your feed, would you more likely to post positive things? Uh, in general, maybe that doesn't sound too bad, but from an informed consent perspective, nobody on Facebook knew, no user on Facebook knew that they were being uh, used in an experiment this way. So there's really big questions about informed consent there. And there are potential hazards here if somebody, a user on Facebook was particularly unstable or in a particularly dark place mentally and they're shown more negative content, there's real potential for harm. And Facebook got a huge amount of slack for this uh, with lots of popular press articles about Facebook's mood manipulation experiment, these kinds of things, and they've paid a pretty heavy price for this kind of work, as has academia at large in no longer being able to use Facebook data as freely as before. And there's a lot of political aspects to this as well with Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 election, these kinds of things. So ethics are, especially when it comes to these large platforms, are important questions. And then there's a pragmatic view. As a professional, you're bound by the ACM Code of Ethics. Uh, even if you aren't necessarily a member of the ACM or the IEEE, there's some legal precedent that as uh, the field generally accepts these ethical standards to be true or to be uh, set standards, uh, if you're in the field, you are generally bound by them. All right, so what does this mean for you? So in terms of ethics presentations, what am I looking for? Uh, every week, there should be two students who post pres their, their presentations. Uh, it won't start immediately. This is starting September 14th. And by the evening of that Monday of that particular week, you should post your presentation. Uh, unless Monday's a holiday, in which case you can hold off until Tuesday. That's fine. Uh, the presentation's form is a 10-minute discussion. You can use slides or not. I don't really care. Uh, but you have to motivate and introduce the ethical issue that you want to discuss. What are some pros and cons, the consequences of, of uh, the ethical issue? So allowing people to, or allowing Facebook to experiment on its user base. Uh, there are certainly pros in terms of massive uh, uh, populations, cons, the ones I mentioned. Uh, what are these issues? And then you have to make some recommendation and justify your position. What do you think is the right course of action here? When I say you don't have to have slides, uh, you can certainly record yourself presenting in front of a whiteboard and writing down, or present a podcast style, or uh, record your drawing on something. All of those things are fine. Critically, you need to have those, those things that I mentioned about motivating your topic, what are pros and cons, and justifying your position, and it needs to be 10 minutes. Those are the main things that I require. All right, some examples about ethical issues you can discuss. Uh, should we ask social media users before we use their data? This is an informed consent question. Uh, on the one hand, maybe that makes sense because it's their data. On the other hand, they published it in a public forum, and if you have to ask all social media users before you use their data, that puts a particular burden on academics who maybe don't have that kind of bandwidth. Um, pros and cons on both sides. Same, what should we do with social media data that an author has deleted? Uh, so imagine you collected a bunch of social media data and then you went back and looked to see what tweets were deleted. Can you predict the deletion of tweets? There's real value in doing that. So if you think a tweet is likely to be a candidate for deletion, you could tell the user that before the user posts it. But at the same time, if a user deletes a tweet, you know that the user doesn't want you to have it anymore. Um, so should you respect the agency or decision of the author there? And then how does this potentially engage uh, or become more complicated with public figures? Should politicians um, have that kind of agency to delete their content? Open questions. What do we do if our algorithms infer incorrect information about individuals? Maybe this isn't a huge deal if it's age or gender but it could be a bigger deal if it's political ideology or uh, sexual orientation, especially if you're talking about sexual orientation in countries where uh, being homosexual is illegal. Same thing if you're talking about more 
uh, draconian or authoritative regimes that can uh, potentially infer information about individuals that could be used against them, or if you if you build a system for inferring or predicting whether somebody is likely to be radicalized or become a terrorist, what are the implications of false positives there? The platforms have a responsibility to police the content their users post. Uh, where does that responsibility lie? Should companies be able to monetize your online behavior? Uh, who does that belong to? Uh, should users get a say in the characteristics that are inferred about them? Can I say I don't want you to infer things about me if I'm posting all this content in a public forum? Uh, who has ethical responsibility for errors in machine learning models, especially given that Facebook and, and Twitter and YouTube and all these social media platforms rely heavily on machine learning for content curation or feed curation? Uh, who, who is responsible if that content is, or if those models are, are wrong? So there are some good examples about Facebook uh, being incorrect when it uh, caught up art and uh, examples of reporting from the Vietnam War that its automated systems identified as being uh, nudity or adult content, um, but clearly has social value since it's reporting of a, of a factual, factual reporting of an event. Who's responsible for suppressing that kind of content or, or who's responsible when the system is suppressing content that it potentially shouldn't? Open questions. Should researchers have to respect terms of service for social media platforms? So we'll talk about this next week, but this is definitely a big question. So uh, say Twitter or Facebook, well, Facebook's done this actually, uh, said that you can't collect data on this platform. Um, no one's allowed to do it using the platform says, or you're using the platform means you have agreed to not uh, collect data on the platform in any sort of algorithmic way. But there's a lot of value in studying Facebook, uh, especially from a political perspective. Where does, how do you balance these two competing interests? So these are just some examples. There are definitely more, if you want more uh, uh, examples, you want to talk about an idea you have, by all means, let me know. I do not require you to identify your topic beforehand, but I do require that no one does the same topic. So if somebody does the same topic as you uh, the week before, then you're kind of out of luck. Uh, you'll have to change up your, your topic. Hopefully that won't happen. You're more than welcome to post what topic you want to do on uh, Canvas and sort of coordinate it there. All right, once you've recorded your presentation, I have a discussion form where you can post it and by clicking this reply button, and then your fellow classmates can reply with questions and you're expected to answer them. Part of your grade will come from your answering these questions and asking questions of other students. To sign up for a date, I have the ethics presentation schedule. Uh, you should see it come uh, Tuesday and Every week, as I said, two students. What you'll do is you'll reply here with the, the week that you want, and based on it's a first come, first serve queue kind of system, I will assign students to their requested weeks. All right, the next thing is the semester project. Uh, the main goal for the project is to give you the opportunity to go deeper on a particular subject that you find interesting on a particular data set a data set that I've given you, a data set that you have from another study, a data set that you go and collect yourself, all of that's open to you. So there are five parts. There's the project proposal, a data collection report, an intermediate report and review. Well, you're ta you'll talk about what you've done, uh, your questions that you have to answer, and your fellow classmates will review it in a sort of peer review kind of fashion. Then you'll give a virtual presentation as though you were giving a presentation at a conference. Uh, and then you'll post a final report on, on Medium, just like the other assignments that you have in your homework. And this will happen over the course of the semester. You can work in teams if you want, um, but the amount of work you do as a team has to scale accordingly. I'll point you at the file that describes this more uh, in depth. So some ideas for a project. You could apply some sort of touchstone or standard techniques from, from class to real-world social media data. 
as long as you are asking some interesting question. You can compare several techniques from class or a technique that we have talked about uh, and evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of each in sort of a evaluation or competing or competition kind of way. Uh, you can create new extensions on techniques from class or anything that uh, is published and say what, why what you're doing is new, what your expectations are. And then you can do surveys of social media users. If you want to do something sort of less quantitative, um, you can do survey work, ask questions of users about how they feel about their, uh, the way their data is used, uh, these kinds of things. These are just some examples. You're free to do uh, anything that sort of relates to social media and data analysis. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. There's a longer form description of this of the, your semester project on Canvas, uh, project 1.0.pdf. You can check it out there. It describes in more detail what each piece is going to be, what each piece should be. All right, the last part of your class uh, credit, it comes from participation. I understand class participation is difficult in an asynchronous class like this, uh, especially during COVID-19, but engagement with students is still, I think, an important aspect of the class, and the class is a seminar-style class, which is part of the reason why you have these ethics presentations and your virtual presentation at the end of the semester. So I'll post discussion questions in the forums. Um, I'll make those available. I do expect you to go read and ask questions and respond to the discussion prompts that I post. Um, and hopefully in, do some engagement with your fellow students. This is an important part of the class. Uh, please engage. The more you engage, the more enjoyable it'll be for everybody. All right, well, that's pretty much it for an overview of the class and its logistics, uh, some things to do for next week. Uh, assignment zero is assigned. That just means go and sign up for a Medium account and send me your username so I can add you to the class pub uh, publication. Go and introduce yourself on the discussion forum. Start thinking about your ethics presentation. When is a good time to do that presentation for you? You need to go and, and sign up for that. And reply here for that. Start thinking about your semester project. The first thing that you'll have to do is write the project proposal. Uh, it's due in a couple of weeks. It's not very long, only 100 or 200 words. But it needs to talk about who's in your group what you'll do, where you'll get your data, what kind of questions are you wanting to ask, or what are you trying to take from the data, why is it interesting, and what contributions are new. What will I or somebody else, some audience member, learn having read your final presentation? All right, that's it. There will be a couple other sets of slides on Canvas for uh, this week. But otherwise, if you have any questions, post in the discussion forums and good luck with the rest of the semester.